I'd like to start by introducing this beautiful child. This is my niece, Maya. She's 21 months of age now. And what you're seeing here is Maya and I and Cookie Monster playing Itsy Bitsy Spider. Uh, Maya lives a thousand miles away from me, so I don't get to see her much face to face. But because of the technology we have available to us, I've been able to talk with her every Monday since before her first birthday. We've been doing this for a little bit less than a year now. And what's become really obvious is that Maya really doesn't have a clue what's happening. She's happy to play along, she's engaged, but she's really confused a lot of the time. So she often will reach out to the screen and try to grab things that she sees in my room. Um, she often will reach underneath the laptop in front of her and feel behind it, apparently looking for the rest of my body. She doesn't know where I've been. And then my favorite moment to date, and this is a true story, I asked her if she wanted to read her book together. There was a book sitting near her. And she stood up and walked away from the laptop and handed it back to me, so I thought, okay, that's not. Um, but she put her hands on the floor and looked between her feet and carefully and slowly backed up. And she sat down on the keyboard. <laughs> so of course she did. She was sitting on my lap, right? This is what we do when we read books together. She was sitting on my lap. Now I realize as a researcher who has studied children and their ability to learn from video for more than a decade, that Maya's behavior is incredibly cute and charming, and I love it. But it also is a great example of the difficulty that toddlers have understanding what two-dimensional media are. They don't understand a photograph or a video screen. Um, and this isn't terribly surprising. So as a professor at the University of Wisconsin, I tell my students, by at least three years of age, children can learn all sorts of things from television. They can learn quite a lot. But television doesn't work so well before the third birthday. It's not as powerful as a tool. And I also teach my students that children Maya's age thrive when they interact with their world, so they can experience cause and effect interactions with the people and the objects around them. And it's this concept that makes me think that interactive media can revolutionize early learning for young children. So this is Cecilia. And when Cecilia was about four years of age, she and her dad came to visit me in my apartment. It was a new place for me, lots of new things to see. Cecilia was looking around and she came to the kitchen and she got excited. She pointed to the kitchen sink and said, Heather, we have this too. It's tough on grease, but soft on hands. <laughs> now, I'll admit it was a little bit horrified uh, by what she had said, um, but I also was a little bit impressed because I was able to recognize what Cecilia was doing is showing the ability of a four-year-old to understand television and to learn from it and to connect what she learned to her real world. Granted, a four-year-old doesn't have the intellectual skills to critically evaluate those messages or to distinguish ones that are academically relevant from perhaps some other kinds of messages, but she certainly can learn. For good or ill, she can learn. And this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone in this room. We're all here because we believe in the power of TED Talks. We believe that one individual can use video to share one great idea with people around the world. So that's the power of video. And this isn't a new concept for children either. About 50 years ago, the United States decided to take action on what was then a growing academic achievement gap for children living in poverty versus those living in more affluent families. And what researchers have found is that kids were entering first grade much less well prepared to learn, and that set them on a trajectory that was negative and became more negative as they continued through school, through high school, and beyond. But one of the things that came out of these conversations early on is that early intervention is key. If we want to help these children, we have to help them before they enter first grade. Um, and one of the outcomes of those conversations was Sesame Street, and I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the show, most of you probably grew up watching the show. It first aired in 1969. Sesame Street was created as an experimental program that brought together all sorts of expertise. It brought together not just media producers and writers, but also academic researchers, teachers, early childhood experts, parents, so they bring together all of these different expertise to create something that they think will really work for children. And it does work. So research has shown that kids can learn all kinds of factual information from Sesame Street, social emotional skills. We know that children who uh, watch Sesame Street during the preschool years are ready to learn in first grade at higher rates than their peers who don't watch Sesame Street and those sorts of programs. And we know that kids who grow up watching Sesame Street before they enter first grade become teenagers in high school who get higher grades in English, math, and science. 
they read more books for fun, and they're more likely to participate in extracurricular activities. Since Sesame Street came on board and showed us what the power of this collaborative effort could be between media producers and researchers and parents and teachers, other programs have followed a similar model, and they've been affected as well. But of course, television has its limitations. And in my mind, one of the greatest limitations of television is that it doesn't seem to work very well before about three years of age. It has that kind of limitation that it doesn't work very early in life. That's for a number of complex reasons, but the main reason is that television viewing is a lot harder than we think. So most of us in this room would think of television watching as sort of a mindless entertainment activity that's not very effortful. But for a very young child, it's very effortful. So for example, if I showed you this image and asked you what you're looking at, you'd have no problem saying, that's an apple. But of course, it's not really an apple. And none of you think it's really an apple. You can't pick it up, you can't bite it, you can't smell it. But you know that it's a symbol that we've all agreed represents an apple that probably existed at one time. So you understand the symbolic nature of this screen image that you're looking at right now. That's not so obvious to a young child. And Maya, during our video chats, gives demonstrations of this all the time when she tries to reach out and hold things that she sees in the room. And in fact, research suggests that it's not until almost a year and a half of age that babies will stop doing this, that they'll stop trying to reach out and grab things that they see on the video screen. And by about a year and a half, they'll learn that those are things we can point at and talk about, but we can't actually do anything with them. We can't hold them or play with them. And some of you might be thinking, well, OK, that's fine. Uh, because babies shouldn't be watching TV. It actually extends far beyond infancy. So even once, at about a year and a half of age, kids are able to recognize what that screen image might be, that it's not an object, but rather a symbol, they still have to be able to map that symbol to something in the real world to be wanting to learn from it. And of course, that's the goal of any educational initiative, is to not just have kids um, learn while they're watching, but to take something away from that experience and apply it to solve a problem in their world. This, again, is something that's very challenging for a very young child. So to give you an example, this is Max. Max came into our lab. I was then at the University of Massachusetts as a graduate student. And he came in to play a hide and seek game on his second birthday. So for me, that meant he was coming to a psychology lab on a university campus so I could assess his ability to learn from media. But to Max, it's just a hide and seek game. So we explain to him, look, we're going to hide the sticker. And then we give him the felt board and we say, OK, Max, find the sticker. Pretty easy, right? Not when he's using video. So some of the kids, the kids Max's age, some two-year-olds came into the lab and they saw us hide the sticker right in front of them. And then we gave them the board. And they can find the sticker almost 100% of the time. Kids do really well even at two years of age with this kind of thing. Lots of studies doing this kind of thing. But Max watched us hide the sticker on video. So he didn't see it right in front of him. He saw it on the video screen in front of him. Then when we give him the board, he has a much harder time finding it. So he finds it in this particular example. But kids this age are only correct maybe about 25% of the time, no more than 50% of the time. They have a much harder time finding that hidden object when they watch it being hidden on video rather than in person. By Max's third birthday, he'll do just fine with video, and he'll do equally well with video in real life. But at this younger age, video is really challenging. And in fact, my favorite anecdotes are when kids come in at two years of age. We show them where we're hiding the sticker on video. And we give them the felt board like we did with Max here. And we say, where's the sticker hiding? And they point up at the television in front of them. They have no clue that we're asking them to do anything with this board that we just put on their laps. They don't understand the connection between those two things. So again, you might be thinking, that's fine. OK, two-year-olds shouldn't be watching television. They should be interacting with their parents and caregivers. They should be playing with peers and siblings. They should be stacking blocks and sticking their toes in the mud. And I would agree with you. They absolutely should be doing all of those things. Those things are all really important, and kids benefit from every single one of them. But I'm going to tell you why I think it's also really important that television doesn't seem to be working very well for two-year-olds. I mentioned this academic achievement gap. And I'm showing you a slide from uh, that's adapted from a very seminal paper in the achievement gap literature, especially with language learning. What you can see here is that um, for kids growing up in more affluent homes, higher income homes, their vocabulary skyrockets as soon as they start talking. And throughout those first few years of life, they're speaking many, many words and they're gaining more every day. And that's true for kids in lower income homes as well. But they're not gaining as much every day. 
So those lines start to diverge as early as 18 months of age, well before two years of age, in fact. So those lines start to diverge and they become further and further apart over time. That gap widens. And by three years of age, at the end of this slide here, 36 months of age, the kids in the higher income homes are speaking twice as many words as the kids growing up in poverty. So this is one of the things we're talking about when we talk about the educational achievement gap in the United States. And yet, we think that educational television holds great power beyond the third birthday, by three years and up. So we have this disconnect between this marvelous, powerful mass media tool and the needs that kids have for early intervention. This is where I think interactive technology might start to bridge this gap. So I'm sure that everyone in this room has seen either in person or online on some viral video, a baby interacting with a touchscreen tablet like this one, using more tech savvy than most of us could muster, certainly. Um, and we wouldn't think it imaginable, but they're very, very good at exploring their environments and figuring out things and testing uh, what, they're, what they're doing and trying to figure out how things work. So this is a really rewarding experience for them to interact with these devices that have so many capabilities. They want to explore and they want to use them. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're learning from them, but we know that they're infiltrating children's environments. So we know that um, there's been a big increase in how much kids have access to these devices. In just a two year period, kids before their second birthday um, were using these tablets at a rate of about 10% in 2011. 10% of kids had used a touchscreen tablet before their second birthday in 2011. Just two years later, in 2013, that number had reached almost 40%. And that was one year ago. And I'm sure in the one year since then, that number has gone well beyond 40% of kids using tablets before their second birthday. So there's really great growing potential here if we can harness that power. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the best kinds of science that show us the impact of early experiences on later development take a really long time to conduct. And because these tablets have entered our lives, all of us, not just children, but adults as well, so rapidly uh, in, in such great numbers and uh, all over the world, science hasn't had a chance to catch up. We really don't know what the impact of these things are going to be on early development. Um, so we're basically conducting a global experiment on children. Around the globe, millions of children were conducting an experiment. And a few years from now, we'll know the results of that experiment. The better news is that some science is starting to catch up a little bit. Um, so some of the research that we're doing in the University of Wisconsin here um, is suggesting that maybe there's potential for these things for very young children. Potential in a way that television hasn't yet mastered. Here's another example. This is Sam. We met with Sam a few months after her second birthday. We went to her preschool to play with one of our hide and seek games. And in this particular game, uh, Sam was uh, Kids like Sam were watching a little cartoon bear hide on the tablet on her left. And then we would cover up the tablet and ask her to find the bear on the flipboard to the right. So very similar to the initial one. And kids like Sam who did not uh, interact with that screen in any way, who just watched the bear hide, that cartoon was animated, they just watched it go, um, they didn't do very well, as we would expect. They weren't able to find the sticker any more than maybe 25% of the time. But for kids like Sam, we made one tiny change to this experiment we've done again and again. All we did differently is we told Sam, rather than watch the bear to see where she's going to hide, we said, touch the bear to see where she's going to hide. That's all we did. And you can see her on the top panel, touch that bear. She removes her hands, the bear hides. She sees the same thing all the other kids do. That one tiny change that we made to this experiment enabled kids like Sam to find that sticker and about twice the rate of kids who didn't touch the screen. That one teeny tiny change, which is nowhere near comparable to a complex video game or anything like that, a complex app uh, for mobile devices. That one little change helped her learn in ways that not interacting with the screen didn't help. And we think that this is really important. There are only a handful of us around the world doing this kind of research. We still have almost no science on what the impact of tablets are on young kids. But we have a couple of studies now that suggest there's actually potential for learning there. Um, much more opportunity than non-interactive video has. We've even found things like kids are more likely to learn new words from people on the screen when they touch the screen in a specific sort of way. So we're trying to figure out how we can capture this potential a little bit. 
I'm sure that most of you also know Mr. Fred Rogers. He's an icon in children's television and a revolutionary who had endless compassion for children and believed very strongly in the obligation that every single one of us has to maximize the well-being for children everywhere. Fred Rogers believed that not everything on television was good. And that's why he believed that he had an obligation. There was an obligation on him as someone in the media industry to create something that might have a more positive impact. He believed that television wasn't going away. And we have a responsibility to harness the power that it has um, to captivate people um, so that we can help children in some way. So I'm here to propose that we follow in Fred's footsteps and we try to harness the power of interactive stream media in a way that might produce something that's actually beneficial for children. Um, and there's, of course, no replacement for quality parent-child interaction, high quality teachers in early childcare settings, good learning materials like books and blocks and homes. There's no replacement for any of those things, and those things are really important. And there are people who are trying to do interventions for children living in poverty to give them those experiences, and those are well worth it, and those people should keep doing what they're doing. And they, those interventions have an enormous impact on the children they can reach. The limitations of those kinds of interventions is that they're costly, they're not very scalable, and they really need direct, direct interaction with families in order to have the best impact. Mass media has its limitations, but the strength that it has is that it's incredibly scalable, and it's very cost effective. So once we make the initial investment of creating something educationally valuable, the additional cost of reaching more and more children with that mass media product is negligible. It costs almost nothing to scale that up, to reach thousands, millions, hundreds of millions of children with that mass media approach. So this is why I think it's really important to try to harness that power. My challenge is this. What if we could create the interactive screen media, touch screen app analog to Sesame Street? Something that would do what Sesame Street has done for kids three and up and scale it down to kids before three, to try to intervene with kids before they get entrenched in these trajectories that follow them and widen and make outcomes worse as they go further and further in school. Intervene as early as possible. If we can follow the Sesame Street model of bringing together app developers and writers and teachers and parents and researchers to figure out what works well, we involve parents so that we can get parents on board so that they would actually use these interactive media with their children, not to replace interaction by any means, but to enhance their interactions. The same for early childhood educators. We can use interactive media to enhance what's already happening in childcare settings, not to replace what's already happening. And I think that if we can do this and do it well, then interactive technology really can revolutionize education for young children by intervening at the earliest possible points we can. And it will have the biggest impact on the kids who need that intervention most.